2020 is the day of reckoning. If there is a day of reckoning, that's when the economic expansion will end and the recession will ensue. No recession in 2019, in large part because we do have more fiscal stimulus. Uh, in 2019, it's mostly deficit financed increases in government spending, and that'll add a lot to growth. And also, we're in a self-reinforcing virtuous cycle. Lots of jobs, low unemployment, wage growth is accelerating. That's supporting more consumer spending, which is causing businesses to hire, which is pushing unemployment down. So we're in a very uh, virtuous cycle, but it can get broken. And in my view, that probably would occur in 2020. So if I had to pick a, a date for the next uh, recession, it would be sometime in 2020. By 2020, there's no more fiscal stimulus. It's all gone, unless Congress and the Trump administration get it together and do something else. But given the politics here, I doubt that very much. Uh, and also, uh, by 2020, interest rates will be higher. The Fed will have raised rates uh, several more times. Uh, that'll put pressure on interest-sensitive sectors of the economy, like housing and the vehicle sector. And, uh, you know, I do think there are imbalances developing in the economy and financial system more broadly that will become exposed as the economy uh, growth slows and interest rates rise. So the most obvious is non-financial corporate debt, so-called leveraged lending. That is a problem, and I think that'll become more obvious as we get, make our way into 2020. So if I had to identify the thing that does this economic expansion in, it'll be high leverage over borrowing in the, in the corporate sector. You've got some companies, uh, multinationals, doing fabulously well. You know, the, the tech companies, a lot of the healthcare companies, pharmaceuticals, they got cash everywhere and they're fine. No problem, balance sheet's very strong. And then on the other side of the distribution, you've got companies that are highly levered. And a lot of it's related to engineering. You've got private equity firms and other uh, non-bank entities coming in, leveraging up these companies. Uh, trying to uh, increase the returns to shareholders through the leverage. So if you add up all of the debt issued by companies that are already highly leveraged, it's, it comes close to $2.8 trillion worth. That, that's a lot. And if you get into an environment where growth is slowing, sales growth is slowing, interest rates are higher, so interest payments on that debt are rising, it's going to put a lot of pressure on those companies because they've got a Hobson's choice. Do I make my debt payment? Or do I cut back hiring? Do I cut back investment? And in most cases, they're going to have to cut back on hiring and investment. Of course, that's the fodder for a recession. I think the Trump administration's economic policies are significantly uh, dangerously misplaced. The federal government is borrowing hand over fist. The debt load is ballooning as we use that money to pay for tax cuts and increases in government spending, that's only temporary. It provides juice for a short period of time and then it goes away. But of course, we're left with the higher debt loads. Now, here's the thing. Deficits and debt don't matter a whole lot in any given year. It's like climate change. We know climate change is a real problem. And if we don't do something about it, it's going to be cataclysmic. We don't know exactly when the crisis is going to hit, but we know it will if we don't change something. That's exactly what the fiscal situation is. If we know it's a problem, it's already hurting the economy, we don't know when it's going to send us off the cliff, but we better do something before it does. And then we also have the trade war, which you know feels like it might be moderating, but who knows? I mean, if that escalates any further, it's already doing damage to the stock market and to the broader economy. It'll do a lot of damage. So the economic policies that the administration is pursuing is doing uh, damage to the economy, and that's going to become uh, increasingly more obvious as we move uh, through 2019 and 2020. And that's why I think 2020 is the day of reckoning. If there is a day of reckoning, that's when the economic expansion will end and the recession will ensue. What makes the American economy special, really? It's the fact that we have the best and the brightest from all over the planet come here and stay here and want to be here and uh, make companies here, innovate here, uh, do things that and, and invent products and services that everyone in the rest of the world wants. And when we shut that down, and that's what we've been doing, uh, we're, we're driving a stake in the heart of what makes our economy tick. And by the way, it's, it's yes, it's all about the best and the brightest, but it's, you know, people who aren't well-educated and skilled, they come here, they work hard, and their kids become the best and the brightest. So that's how, this, this, that's how America became America. And if you want to raise the growth of the U.S. economy on a sustained basis, not a sugar high, not a one-year burst of growth, deficit finance, but if you really want 
sustained economic growth, what you would do is you would dramatically increase immigration, dramatically, and bring those people in, assimilate them, educate them, let them shine. And, you know, here's the thing. It's inevitable. We're going to do it. You know why? Because right now our biggest problem, and for the foreseeable future, our biggest problem is going to be a lack of labor, right? The baby boom generation, my generation, is retiring en masse. So our, our population, the people who are, number of people who are working will decline if we don't allow more immigrants into the country. So our problem, our demographic problem is, is we're not going to be able to address our fiscal problems, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, if we don't change policy with regard to immigration. It's not, we shouldn't be restricting immigration. We should be opening our arms, embracing the world, and like letting more immigrants into the country. Yeah, for sure, it's a crisis. I mean, we're up to 1.5 trillion in student loan debt outstanding, and you know that's double what it was, say, 10 years ago. I mean, uh, these, a lot of kids just really, because of the high tuitions and the lack of other support, have had financial support, have really had to take on loans and lord it up on those loans to get any kind of education. So clear, and it's it's a problem. You know, it, it's one reason why millennials are starting families later. It's probably a reason why becoming homeowners later. It's why they're starting companies later. You know, when I started my own company back in 1990, I did it with a home equity line of credit, right? I own my home and then I could borrow against my equity and I use that to finance my business for the first three months. So can you really, you can't do that if you're not a homeowner. So, you know, it is a crisis. You know, it's not existential. You know, it's not like this, like a cliff event. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, you're going to have, a, you know, a recession because of student loan debt. But it's certainly a, you know, a problem for these kids and, and for the broader economy and uh, you know, something we, you know, we really need to face up to. And I think the solution here really, and this is very, going to be very difficult to get from here to there, but you know, all of our policies to support kids get education, higher education, is to make it cheaper and easier for them to get a loan. Here I would take the subsidy away from student loans because there's a fixed supply of education. You throw increased demand on a fixed supply, what happens? The price rises, the tuitions rise, and thus you're not going anywhere in terms of the affordability of higher education. So these poor kids, they take on all this debt, and it's like they're on a financial treadmill because the tuition just goes up and captures you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the subsidy that's provided to allow them to take a loan. So we should be thinking about how do we not support demand, but how do we increase supply of educational services and lower the cost, lower the tuition, and expand out the availability? And, you know, really change the attitudes with respect to community colleges, technical schools, e-learning. Not everyone has to go to a four-year college, right? I don't, don't think it makes sense. In case, many cases, these kids who are struggling with the, the debt are the ones that went to a four-year college, got uh, a major that is not marketable, and then they're stuck in jobs that don't have salaries sufficient to pay on the student loan debt. So forget about all that. You know, help incent them and change the attitudes with respect to going to, you know, be, becoming a technician or working in uh, trades and in different types of activities that doesn't require for your education. So Germany is very good at this, for example, right? They've got all kinds of support for technical skills, and uh, their economy benefits from that. We should do the same kind of thing.